Good to see everyone who can be here tonight. I'm thankful to have this opportunity to stand before you, and I ask for this topic that I might present it. So now you think what a foolish thing to volunteer for a topic like this, but I'd, I've done many foolish things in my life, so we'll, we'll just add this to the list. What does it mean to solve church problems larger than one congregation? And you may say, well, we don't, we don't have that. Uh, well, actually, we do. Uh, we do have problems that are larger than one congregation, and we have them very frequently. And we do have a system of solving problems larger than one congregation. So it's only appropriate to ask, well, how does that system work? And each of us would answer from our own perspective because we might say, well, as far as I'm concerned, it's working fine. And someone next to us may say, as far as I'm concerned, it's not, one, it's not working at all. But the issue is, whenever things happen in the Lord's church, does God have uh, principles for us to understand? And if he does, how do we do it seeking those principles? And how do we do it following them? So sometimes, how are we doing with the problems among us? Well, sometimes we're doing fine. Sometimes we're not doing well at all. Sometimes, eh, I don't know. So we want to look at the scriptures, and I'll do an overview of many things having to do with problem handling in the Lord's church. But as we all know, the preferred time to learn how to solve any problem is when there's not a problem. In your family, if you have no one in your family having issues in their marriage, that's a great time to study divorce. Because if you wait until somebody is about to split up and go their separate ways in your family, you are going to be biased in how you study the scriptures. So if you have no one in your family having problems at all, study the subject. It will be a great study and you'll benefit greatly from it. The best time what to, to do, the best time to study what to do when loved ones leave the church is when everybody in your family is faithful. Because I guarantee you, when your loved ones do leave the church, it's when you start saying, oh, well, it's this person's fault over here. It's this person's fault over here. And anyone can be susceptible to those kinds of temptations. And the best time to study how to solve problems larger than one congregation is when we don't have any. And I would love to be able to say right now, I don't know of any problems that are larger than one congregation. I would love to say that, but that is not the truth. And so as I present these concepts, you may say, well, I don't know what your involvement is in these problems that are larger than one congregation, but it's obviously biased you in this way or the other, and I'll say, I'm sure you're right. I'm sure you're right. And what I have found is that among us, as in every area of life, there is no shortage of advisors after the storm. No shortage at all. There's a lot of people that can tell you exactly what you should have done when they're safely away from what happened. So we're not always well prepared for what we face in life. And I hope that we're all doing the very best we can to do what is right before God. Because everything we experience in our life, in our family, in our congregation, in our work, can cloud our ability to think clearly when similar things happen to others. Sometimes we'll be tempted to just go along, to get along. Sometimes you'll say, oh, I'm tired from the last battle that I had. I'm not going to get involved in this one. Or it's like, oh, I'm going to tiptoe by this, and I'm not going to stop like the Good Samaritan in this situation. I'm just going to go by on the other side. We can be tempted to ignore. We can be tempted to overlook sins, especially when they are sins we may have committed ourselves in the past. We can all be respecters of persons, when we're attempting to help a situation. So Paul wrote a congregation about sins, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. So as God's people, we know there are things that we really don't want to have anything to do with, including not being deceived with empty words. And that probably applies mostly to a situation in this environment, because if we're not careful, the words that we take as instruction from God can actually be empty words. And that is why if you attend any of these sessions, you'll not only hear the presentation, but you'll hear individuals opening their Bible and saying, what about this scripture? What about this scripture? Because we do not want to be taught by empty words. 
neither do we want to deceive anyone with empty words when we are who we are supposed to be. We do not want to be partakers with those who are the sons of disobedience. That is not who we want to be. An evangelist, Timothy, was warned by Paul to be very careful, but he could receive accusations against elders when there were two or three witnesses, and those who were sinning were to be rebuked in the presence of all. And I'm going to talk a lot about transparency in the midst of issues. And Timothy was told, you observe these things without prejudice. You do nothing with partiality. Do not lay hands hastily on anyone, and this has to do with disciplining. Do not share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. And this last, verse, this last part of the verse has to do with in handling problems. Now, purity is always enjoined for Christians. But the evangelist who works with individuals who are having problems is to keep himself separate from the sins that are involved in those problems. There's a strict warning for those of us who are preachers. Carl Johnson, commenting on this, says this phrase, lay hands suddenly on no man, implies the seizing of another and removing him from his place. Even though this action is not to be performed literally, the context demands that removal from office is being considered. Paul commands Timothy to show no partiality even in the case of an elder and warns him to give due consideration to the matter and to conduct a thorough investigation before any action is warranted. So if an elder has so sinned as to demand that he be removed from office, he must be removed. An evangelist who refuses to see what steps, that steps are taken to remove him, becomes guilty of partaking of the sins of the elder. This situation would, in modern terms, be likened to a cover-up. So the concept is, when we ignore problems, we are part of the problem. And that is true in our own lives, especially, and it is also true in our families, and it is also true in our congregations. When we will overlook sins that should not be overlooked, then we become partakers in that evil. And we're basically bidding Godspeed to things that we say we would never do. Well, our model for relationship with God is always Jesus, who said, I do not seek my own will, but the will of my Father who sent me. Jesus was and is always obedient to the will of the Father, even to the point of dying on the cross. He humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And we are to be individuals who always obey, as Paul spoke of our brethren at Philippi. Yet they were to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. It was to be something that we are dreading if we might displease God with the decisions that we make. We do not want to displease God with our decisions. And we are then to do all things without complaining and disputing. Oh, we can pause right there for, I don't know, a year or two and ponder what that means. No complaints, no disputes. That's God's will. That you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. That is the world around us. Let it never be our brothers and sisters in Christ that we are with. And when we are surrounded by those who can be described as crooked and perverse, who are we to be? We are to be among those who shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. We are to be people of the book after the example of Jesus, and we are to hold fast to that word of life, the holy scriptures that are able to make you wise for salvation, Paul tells Timothy, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Our task of faith is always to seek God's will and to understand what the will of the Lord is. So we are always looking beyond ourselves and our own knowledge to make sure that we are doing what God wants in every area of our life because faith always asks the question, Lord, what do you want me to do? As exemplified by Saul, in his conversion, and by the Jews at Pentecost. Faith always asks, what do you want me to do? And faith always then attempts to obey exactly what God wants to do when that faith is based on the Word of God. Salvation is only in Christ, and when we are in Christ, we are new creatures, born of the water and of the Spirit, baptized into His death, and we rise from that watery grave to walk in newness of life. And when we are saved, we're added to the Lord's church, the gathering of those who are separated from the world. And the Lord added daily to the church, to the gathering of those who are separated from the world, those who were being saved. And we then, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So we being many are one body, Romans 12, 
3 through 6. And Alan, writing on this, said, Those who do measure themselves by the standard of God's Word will recognize that the church constitutes one body. No one member exists for himself, but all are members one of another. Apart from one another, a member can do little or nothing. In fact, members so separated will die spiritually. Working together under the authority of the body's head, which is Christ, all members can accomplish great things for the good of the cause of Christ. Believers who measure themselves by God's word will recognize the equality that all members share before God, whether their individual functions or gifts are more or less impressive than others. And every one members of another means members of a congregation are so related to one another and their interdependence is so close that none can afford to feel proud over the others. McKnight says, Alan quotes, the meaning of the figure is that Christians depend on one another for their mutual edification and comfort as the members of the human body depend on one another for nourishment and assistance. We need each other. We have to have each other in our service of the Lord because we together make up the Lord's body. As Christians, we function as individuals and collectively as the body of Christ. When we obey the gospel individually, we are added to the universal church, the church of Christ, where we gather with and identify with the congregation of the church of Christ to function as we are directed in the word of God. Under the rule and direction of our King and Redeemer Jesus, how he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So our response to God's will should always be like that of Jesus in the garden, not my will but yours, and this is easier said than done. So there are many times obeying God may be very, very difficult for us. It may be the hardest thing we've ever thought we would face. That does not lessen the obligation because people of faith will always want to know God's will and people of faith will always do their best to obey God's will, no matter the cost. In faith, we acknowledge God's will by our obedience, as Tozer writes, the Bible recognizes no faith that does not lead to obedience, nor does it recognize any obedience that does not spring from faith. Our faith is to come from the Word of God, and we know that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him, after the example of Abraham, who obeyed by faith. And we, with our faith, are to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So when it comes to addressing problems that we might have as people of faith who obey, well, what do we do when we have problems? Well, we should turn to the Word of God because it's the Word of life. It's how we are complete, thoroughly, thoroughly equipped or furnished for every good work. Here are some of the problems we may encounter. As individuals, we may have personal illnesses or issues or temptations that we deal with in our lives, and these may or may not be shared. The Apostle Paul said, I discipline my body and keep it under control. Well, why do you need to do that, Paul? Well, what's going on with you? He didn't tell us, did he? So as we sit here tonight, if a list of our problems were to suddenly magically appear over our heads and the people around us could see it, we'd say, oh, oh that's bad. But we don't share those things. And when no sin is involved, there's no reason to share those things. I've often said to, to individuals, if we could take all of our issues in life and suddenly they were visi visible and physical and we could throw them in a pile in the middle over here um, and we could see what people are dealing with in their lives, we would be jumping into that pile to get ours back. Because I guarantee you there's some burdens in this assembly that we don't want to carry. But there are people who carry those burdens every day and they do so only with the Lord's help and the help of those who love them. Paul said, I discipline my body and keep it under control. And so we do have those things of a personal nature that we, we may not choose to share with anyone. And that's okay. In our families, all in our family may know of problems within the family. But if no sin is involved in those problems, then no one outside the family needs to know about such things. And if such things are shared, then it is up to the members of the family but sharing would not be necessary to either help or to hurt the situation. For example, a member of the family is on medication for something or is seeing a counselor for something. Nobody needs to know that outside the family. Now, once upon a time, I thought, well, what's a medicine cabinet for? Now I know I'm going to need two if I keep going here. So it 
But then, and who needs to know things like that? Some among us share everything going on in our lives with everyone. Our oldest grandson just cannot keep things to himself. He never has been able to. He would get in the car and just in the process of saying hello, he would tell you everything that was going on in his parents' fan, in his parents' conversations. It was wonderful. We always, we always knew what was going on in that house. He just couldn't help himself. He just had to talk. And then others of our grandchildren, you practically have to pry a word out of them with a crowbar. They don't say a word. Well, some of us share nothing with anyone. These are choices that we can make. However, if there is sin within a family, if there's sin within a family, there are some secrets that must never be kept. See, it is not appropriate for anyone in a family to be threatened in any way so that they will keep secrets of sin that are happening in that family. And you think, well, nobody does that. Yeah, they do. They do. And we've heard a lot about that in the last few days. And those secrets then are born by the individuals, many times the little individuals, that have those horrible secrets until they cannot carry that burden anymore. And so there are some secrets that should not be kept. It's not a matter of daddy is getting mama this present for her birthday and don't tell her. That's a fun secret. But it's a matter of if there's abuse in the family, no child should ever be asked to keep that horrible secret. And no spouse of an abusive parent or spouse should ever keep a secret that their spouse is abusing their children. And what happens many times is one is the abuser and one is the enabler and everyone suffers. And the church suffers when things like that are happening in our congregations. We tell our children, and we well should, tell someone you trust if you are being treated or touched in ways that make you uncomfortable. Tell someone you trust. And if you don't trust anyone around you, tell the police. Call 911 and let them know that Uncle so-and-so is touching you in a way that makes you uncomfortable. You'll have flashing lights outside your house and you will get somebody to help. And if that happens to be a house that belongs to somebody who's a member of the church, the lights will flash and you will go to jail. And we will visit you in prison, but you will be where you belong. Don't for an instant think that it is okay for any of us to harm our children in this way. It's a, it's a plague on our society, and it is a plague in the church, and it has affected the leadership of the Lord's church for many years, and it is shameful. It is shameful what we have asked people to keep as a secret in our families. And I have seen situations like this where looking back later, I think, my, I should have known. I should have known. We can learn. We can learn as we go. And what we end up doing through life is saying, oh, I want to help anybody that's caught in a situation like that. I want to help anyone who is ever feeling threatened by their environment. I want to help any little boy, any little girl who is being bothered in a way that's not appropriate. I want to help any spouse who's being bothered in a way that's not appropriate. And I am willing to stand up anywhere at any time to anyone to do that. I don't care what anybody says about me. Now, just so you know, and you'll see this in a slide later, I've had some new name calling since I've started going to different places in the world. You know, on Facebook is where I advertise all my preaching stuff. The latest name I've been called is the Antichrist. Like, well, that's a new one. That's a new one. So I've been called everything else. And so if someone is saying to me, will you help me because this is what's going on in my home and this is how I'm being bothered in my home, and somebody says, will you help me? I'll say yes. I will say yes. And when someone says, well, you're just fill in the blank, it's like, oh, until you can get to the level of calling me Antichrist, you don't even get started. I could care less what people think of me in matters like this. I care everything about the safety of our children, 
and the safety of our homes for each one of us, no matter our age. And until we have, to me, that kind of passion about everyone around us, we're just tiptoeing around problems and pretending they don't exist because they're out there. And statistics tell us that problems like that are out there and we need to be aware of them. Okay, congregational issues. There are many of those that affect only one congregation. And whether or not to share these things are judgment calls. Philippians 4.2, I uh, implore Iodia and, and Syntyche to be the same mind in the Lord. We're not told what was going on. By the way, these names are two sisters. So Paul says, ladies, get along. Can you imagine being in the audience when the letter was read for the first time and you're named? And you look over and you see the other sister and it's like, oh, everybody in the congregation knew what was going on. And now they're faced with, uh-oh, Paul said we need to get along. Be of the same mind. Corinth's leaders should have already made the decision about the immoral brother when Paul wrote to them. They should have already done that. They should have handled that in-house. Leaders can decide who to participate in leading and serving in worship. And if an erring brother has repented, they can decide how long somebody keeps their seat. And it may be for the rest of their life. There is no written rule that a man who has made a confession must immediately be put in the pulpit or put before a congregation to lead a song. So congregational leaders make those decisions, and those are decisions that affect only one congregation. There are also issues that affect only one congregation, but the nature of the problem indicates a need for outside help. So a congregation without elders will seek an evangelist's help to be set in order. A congregation in chaos will seek help. Now, in the days of the New Testament, there were two offices, uh, that could go from congregation to congregation, apostles and evangelists. Today, we only have evangelists who can declare that. So as Chloe reached out to Paul, so congregations today can reach out to an evangelist they trust and say, could you help us? Because we have some problems. And congregations may choose to ask an evangelist to help with a wayward eldership. And they are to be very careful. We are to be very careful if we are asked to help in those situations. And again, these are within a congregation. Also, there are issues that are larger than a congregation that involve multiple congregations cannot be solved by only one congregation's leadership. And so we arrive at Acts chapter 15, where uh, two congregations and others are involved, Antioch and Jerusalem, Acts 15, 1 through 5, and certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small distance in dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, why did Antioch's leaders make this particular journey? It was not to learn the truth about bringing circumcision into the church. It was not to learn what to do from a mother church, the original first congregation in Jerusalem. It was not to learn what to do from Peter as if he were the head of the church. The false teachers that traveled from congregation to congregation were stopped at Antioch. Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute, which means they refuted their false teaching. They stopped them from continuing to do that at Antioch. And their false teaching was that circumcision is required in the New Testament church. That was settled at Antioch publicly for that congregation. However, some very important matters remained. They also said, where are you from? And these false teachers were from Jerusalem. And the question becomes, had the Jer Jerusalem church recommended them and authorized them to preach this false doctrine? Because this was a fellowship issue that had to be answered. Well, this was such an important issue that Paul was inspired that with the leadership from Antioch, there would be a delegation that would go to Jerusalem. He went up by revelation. And that journey was for the purpose of determining cooperation and fellowship between congregations and Christians over the subject of circumcision being required in the New Testament church. Separation in distance is never supposed to mean separation in doctrine. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we think, oh, those brethren in Africa, they don't matter. Oh, those brethren in Central America, they don't matter. If they disfellowship somebody, it doesn't affect us here. Think again. 
Think again, please. Separation and distance does not mean separation in doctrine. Here's a church directory that someone compiled from AD 70. That circle is to represent the area from Antioch to Jerusalem. And if I looked at this right, I put down 300 miles. There's various other measurements that you'll see in looking this up. So the journey from Antioch to Jerusalem, and please allow this to be close, was 300 miles. 300 miles. Is fellowship and congregational cooperation important enough to walk 300 miles one way? Is solving problems that are between more than one congregation important enough to walk 300 miles? Now, brothers, those of us who are preachers, some of us shy away from problems like a mule from a mud hole. Some of us would not bother to walk across the street to help a congregation or a family with their problems, <laughs> let alone be willing to walk 300 miles. And they walked without a reservation. There was no communication like we're accustomed to. So the Antioch group walked to Jerusalem in faith that they would be received, but there was no guarantee. The journey would have taken, it would have taken a long time for me because I don't walk that far anymore. And they stopped along the way. So you just think how long it would take you to walk 300 miles. And every step of the way, you know the reason you're doing is very, very important. So are individuals willing to go all over the country if there's problems in a congregation? Yes, we are. Are individuals willing to go all over the world if there are problems? Yes, we are. And it's a lot easier for us today than it was for them. As they traveled, they visited sister congregations reporting the success of sharing the gospel among the Gentiles in Antioch. And it just so happened that Titus, who was uncircumcised, was part of the troop that traveled. So this was a living example of the mixture of Jew and Gentile in the Lord's church as they traveled. When they arrived in Jerusalem, the Antioch group was received by the church. There was a private meeting between the leaders of Antioch and the leaders at Jerusalem. And this was not a meeting to ask permission for anything. This was a meeting for Antioch to explain, here's what we teach, here's what we practice, here's the situation we have encountered that involves you. And the Jerusalem leaders then would have understood their responsibility was to listen and to decide what their response was going to be to this situation. And implied in this, of course, is that the Jerusalem leaders would have felt free to ask the Antioch leaders questions to make sure they understood the situation. There was no such thing as each of them telling the other what to do. That is not the purpose of this meeting at all. So Antioch's task was not to tell Jerusalem what to do, only to explain the situation. Jerusalem's task was not to tell Antioch what to do, only to understand so they could make a proper response. Then there was a public meeting in front of the whole congregation where the great work that was being done among the Gentiles was reported to everyone. And again, the entire troop from Antioch was there, including uncircumcised Titus. So during that public meeting, the Judaizing teachers made their request known that circumcision must be part of the church. And the circle of leadership for Jerusalem discussed this situation. And I do believe in the Lord's church, each congregation has a group of leaders, and they should be faithful men. And if any congregation is being led by someone other than faithful men, then they're not being led very well. And that will become very, very apparent in situations like this whenever there's a difficult thing to consider and individuals are not well versed in the Word of God. And so, the Jerusalem church confirmed um, uh, that what they were hearing was valid. Paul and Barnabas gave a report about the miracles that, con that were confirming their good work uh, among the Gentiles. And Jerusalem crafted a letter uh, that was inspired by the Lord and shared with the entire congregation for their approval and it disavowed any approval of the false teachers who traveled to them uh, and to other congregations. Here's the letter. The apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words unsettling your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, uh, men who have risked their lives for the name 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. So this letter mentions those leaders, the main leaders from Antioch, and those who were going to accompany the letter, the Judas and Silas, that was going to be carried to all the places where the false teachers had gone. At no time was any individual's free will or congregation's autonomy violated. Antioch reported but did not decide for Jerusalem. Jerusalem received them, listened to them, listened, discussed the issue, decided what to do, but did not ask Antioch for permission and did not tell Antioch what to do. Jerusalem did take responsibility for what had been preached using their congregation's good name and made a statement for all to see and understand for all time. But yet some issues remain. Jerusalem disavowed sending these men out to teach this false doctrine. What did Jerusalem do about these false teachers? We don't know. That's not part of the account that we're, we're given. But they weren't finished. When the Antioch group left, Jerusalem was not finished. What does a congregation do if they discover someone coming from them is teaching false doctrine? Well, there's more work to be done. So Antioch's leaders did their duty. They had already stopped the false teachers and they asked, where are you from? And then they got the information that they sought. So Antioch's leaders were willing to walk 300 miles to Jerusalem, 300 miles back home. And is our cooperation and fellowship this important? Yes, it is. It really, really is. Just as an individual is free to choose if and how they will serve the Lord, congregations are free to do the same. As Wayne Jackson says, there are two broad areas of activity in which a church may operate. That is in the realm of the essentials and in the sphere of expedience. And the last paragraph says, on the other hand, in matters that have not been specified, human judgment must be exercised. It is obvious, therefore, that the principle of self-rule does not apply in cases where doctrinal truth is at stake. Church autonomy prevails only in matters of expediency. So individuals do not have the right to decide what items we will have in worship. And so we know that we assemble on Lord's Day. What time to assemble, whether to meet in a home or to rent or purchase a building, these are matters for us to decide in our leadership, so long as what is selected does not violate what is revealed. How many songs to lead in worship up to the judgment of the leaders, whether or not to have a cappella music has been designated by God. Each congregation named and applied in Acts 15 had self-rule, and this includes Jerusalem and Antioch and every congregation in the areas they visited on their way. We are not told how these other congregations reacted when the false teachers came to them, but they too could have gone to Jerusalem because every congregation has self-rule and can act independently. But there are other choices Jerusalem could have made. What if Jerusalem had refused to see them at all? Or what if Jerusalem did agree to see them, listened respectfully, and refused to do anything to stop the Judaizing teachers? So let's just go down the road of what if Jerusalem had refused to see them? So just pretend with me for a moment. Uh, that this was the conversation among the Jerusalem leaders. Who's outside? Who wants to talk to us? Well, people from Antioch. There's Paul, Barnabas, and they have a young man named Titus with them. What, what do they want to talk to us about? Well, we have a group preaching among the churches in their area. They, they want to talk to us about them. It's probably a complaint of some kind. Oh, I've never liked Paul. You know, he killed one of my relatives. I've never liked Barnabas. He, he introduced Paul to us before. I don't know this Titus, but I've heard he's not one of us. I've heard he's uncircumcised. You know, our teachers that went out from us, they are brilliant. They are amazing. Just look at all the good they do in the church. You know, we don't like these fellows that came from Antioch. We don't need to pay any attention to them. Just tell them to go away. Could that have been Jerusalem's decision? Yes, it could have. What would Antioch have done? Well, they would have broken down the door. They would have walked. No, they wouldn't have. They would have left. If we're not received, we leave. Because if we're not received, we can't help. If we're not received, we can't share what we believe the will of the Lord is. This could have been Jerusalem's decision. Now, in Acts 15, what was most important? The messengers or the message? Paul was a murderer. That's what he had been. Barnabas had introduced him. Titus was an unknown. I guarantee you there were people in the church at Jerusalem that were still very afraid of Paul and remembered well that he had killed their family. But which was most important? The messengers or the message? 
Today, when situations arise among us and it's difficult to know exactly what to do, it appears that we are far more concerned about the messengers than we are the message. That is up to us. That is up to us individually, whether or not we care for the messengers who are trying to deliver a message. In this case, the message and the messengers were carefully chosen by the Holy Spirit. We don't have that direct guidance today. We are not inspired. We are flawed men who have and will make many mistakes, but we care enough about the Lord's church to go to the ends of the earth to try to help. Hebrews 5 verse 14 talks about having senses exercised to discern both good and evil. I remember a fellow who talked about having good judgment. Well, where does good judgment come from? It comes from having had bad judgment and survived. And where does wisdom come from for many of us? It comes from studying the Word of God and from making mistakes and doing our best to recover and go on. Our senses are exercised when we do our best, even as we make mistakes along the way, and no one ever will be perfect whenever they come and say, can we talk? Who among us claims infallibility in handling church problems? No one can, and no one does, and therefore we who do attempt to help are extremely vulnerable to criticism. And some of that criticism may be valid. And some of that criticism may be appropriate. When somebody said, you know, Paul killed a member of my family, if that was the conversation, that would have been true. Someone may say, well, I don't like that Greg Gay fellow. He said this, 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 or this. And yeah, that's probably true. And so, well, I don't like him, and I heard others don't. And I say to that, get in line. Get in line. This is not a popularity contest for preachers. And any preacher who thinks preaching is a popularity contest needs to go do something else because there are problems that are larger than us. And any problem that comes along, we need to be able to give our all or to get out of the way for others who will. Expect to have individuals and congregations say things like, you know, we, we don't like the way you did this or that or the other. We canceled your meeting. We're dropping your support. Your preaching career is over. Don't you love these people? If you love them like you should, you'd never say these things. Don't you know how much good they've done? Don't you know how much we need them? What are you, wh who are you to say anything? I know some of the mistakes you've made in your life. And I have found that individuals will say anything to avoid facing problems that are being considered. Can you imagine Someone who's a leader in the Lord's church, instead of facing a problem about abuse, saying something to the effect of, well, at least it was boys and not girls. When we don't want to face a situation, sometimes we will say things that when looked at from afar, will say, oh, that's so sad. That is so sad. When someone says, I do not like that Greg Gay, I don't want him coming around with anybody doing anything, like, who's the most important here? What's the most important here? Not the messenger, but the message. We all have independence, we all have free will, and if we're afraid of losing a meeting, or if we are afraid of losing friends in the Lord's church, then our help will always be biased. And when faced and confronted with problems larger than one congregation, and a gospel preacher says, well, I'm all for you, but I'm not going to get involved. Like, no, then you're not all for me, brother. You're not all for me at all. And it's not about me. It's about what's right. And when one of those little boys or one of those little girls asks for help and you say, I've got a meeting, you're hiding, you're hiding, you're hiding, and you're not helping. Now, Proverbs 26, 17, he who passes by and meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a dog by the ears. Whew. When others are asked to get involved in difficult situations, most of us would say, oh, Thank you to the other brethren who are handling this. Thank you. But sometimes the household of Chloe knocks on our door. Are we willing to help? Sometimes someone who has been abused knocks on our door. Will you be willing to help? It takes a very special relationship 
with our own family as preachers to help others. It takes a very special relationship to do that because our families share us with the brotherhood in good times and in bad times. At the same time, even if we say, yes, I'm willing to help, that does not mean we're perfect. I'm sure I have more doubts about the decisions I've made in my life than anyone. And when individuals say things about me, it's like, oh my, I, I don't want that to be true. I'm going to do everything I can in my life to make sure that what I have been called is not appropriate. But every congregation has autonomy. Had Jerusalem's decision been to turn them away or do nothing after hearing the report, there is a consequence. There would have been no more fellowship between Antioch and Jerusalem. And we can be very thankful that that did not happen. But you see, autonomy is not a license for silence. Autonomy is a mandate for openness, for transparency, and for communication. Now, I don't care if leaders of a congregation say, I really don't like the fact that you're asking to meet with us. I really don't like the fact that you're here. I really don't like this. But come on in. Let's sit down. Yeah, we agree. We really don't like being here either. But these are situations we need to talk about. So the New Testament reveals many, many issues among most congregations. Multiple letters of the Bible reveal issues of congregations wanting to go back to the law of Moses. Corinth had issues in many areas, so many that Paul said, the rest will I set in order when I come. The book of Revelation has problems to be corrected in multiple congregations to maintain faithfulness. And there's a disclosure of individuals as well. Eodian and Sinsky, Paul, Ananias and Sapphira, Demas, the immoral man of Corinth, Mark, Paul and Barnabas, Hymenaeus and Alexander, Alexander the coppersmith, Diotrephes, Peter not eating, eating with the Gentiles, and Archippus. Paul said to him, see that you fulfill the ministry that you've received in the Lord. And that is Paul telling an evangelist, get to work. Get to work. And sometimes that's what we need to be told. Why are we given this information? Because light overcomes darkness. Unfruitful works of darkness must be exposed rather than kept secret. So when we expose unfruitful works of darkness, it means we do not keep bad things hush-hush. While we may not tell everyone, we do need to tell some. And within this circle of leadership of faithful men of each congregation, there's a responsibility to know the dangers to their flock and to share those dangers appropriately. Obey those who have the rule over you, be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. This is a sleepless watch, lest the congregation be harmed. Those dangers must be shared as is appropriate, sometimes only in the leadership, sometimes among families, sometimes with the whole congregation. The publicity of the sin depends on the influence of the sinner. And so we start with the Apostle Peter. He received the maximum publicity. Paul confronted him to his face before them all. And it says he was to be plain. Now there's one apostle, among others, named as traveling with his wife. That's Peter. He's an elder, so he had children. It is very likely that when the Apostle Paul called the Apostle Peter a hypocrite, that Peter's wife and children were in the audience. That can never stop what the church has to do. That can never stop what preachers have to do. We can never withhold doing what the church needs to do because of the innocent individuals who may be present when this discipline takes place. To do so means that we are enabling innocent individuals to enable and continue wrong. Elders who sin are to be, re be rebuked before the entire congregation. And evangelist Demas was told about his departure. We are all told about that. Mark, the gospel writer, his defection was told, even though he was restored some 20 years later. Revisiting Matthew chapter 18. The process of going through Matthew 18 ends up being tell it to the church. And a lot of times it's like, oh, if we have a problem, we have to keep it right here in our local congregation. Nobody can know. We're a vault. We have to keep it right here. You know, there's two times in Matthew that the word church is used. One is the universal church. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. And I understand the second and only other time the word is used in Matthew is here. When someone refuses to be disciplined, you're to tell it to the church, which I say means that it is not only told to local congregation, it can also be told to other congregations as is appropriate. Now, in an area like Oklahoma City, where there's a lot of congregations, there's a lot of people who have been to a lot of places. And sometimes when they go to a new congregation, the congregation where they've been knows why they left. 
but they don't share. Let's revisit keeping all individual sins secret in our congregation. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul gives a list of sins. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, do not be deceived, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. You see, lists of sins in the Bible are not randomly chosen. Why these ten sins out of the many that could be listed? Who needs to know if the members of the church are working to put these sins behind them? I think Paul shared this list of sins for a reason. And if you look at each one of these very, very carefully, if you're going to have somebody over for a meal, can it be helpful to know that they were an idolater? Can that determine what food you would serve them? If you have children, can it be helpful to know that someone was a molester of children? You see, each one of these is not only a prevention for further sin, the knowledge of these sins in the people's lives at Corinth is a prevention for those who did commit those things to not do it again. Because that is bringing light to darkness. So if we knew someone in the congregation had been a predator of young men or women, boys or girls, is that, is that helpful for the leaders or the parents to know? If we know about a man in the congregation who's a womanizer, is that helpful for leaders and families to know? Have there been among us preachers who've harmed young boys and girls? Yes. Some of them are dead, but some are alive. When that has happened and was known, if those preachers moved on, was the next congregation warned? If not, then silence means whoever made that choice has created a problem larger than one congregation. And I happen to know, because I'm old, of families who are suffering from abuse that happened 50 plus years ago. And that suffering continues through multiple generations because of what was done to their ancestor many, many years ago by a gospel preacher. What if the next place the predator lands is in your home with your son, with your daughter? Would you like to know that before sin happens? There have been preachers and leaders among us who were womanizers. I know of several, some dead, some living. One left town after a member of the community complained to the church about the preacher's inappropriate behavior with his wife. If that preacher moves to where you live, would you like to know what happened where he lived before from the leaders of that last congregation? There have been among us individuals who sow discord everywhere they go. Here's a rule of thumb. If you're relieved when a family leaves your congregation, do you share the reason for that relief with the leadership of the next congregation? If not, you have aided in creating a problem that is larger than one congregation. Many, many years ago, Brother Benny told me a story about a family who lived in a place and then they moved on. And the very next Sunday, the announcement was made in that congregation that the so-and-so family has moved and we are so glad. Now, that gives relief to the congregation they've left, but did those leaders give any warning? Imagine a world where as people decide to go from place to place, they need to get a letter of recommendation from where they've been. Now this is not a Baptist letter placing membership. This is saying if you're going to show up on our door, we need to know from where you've been if you've caused them problems. Because we may ask you to not stop here. We may ask you to go on. We may ask you to go back and make some things right because you've left turmoil and discord where you have been. And see, this individual, Apollos, was able to explain the way of the Lord, but he wasn't known. So the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And so he had a letter of recommendation. I have in my treasures an old letter of recommendation from my grandfather, Homer Gay, where leaders from Lebanon, Missouri said, here's this man, we recommend him highly. So if a new family comes, ask for a letter, and let me tell you about a mistake I made. A married woman sleeps with a married man who's not her husband. They're both Christians from different congregations. One of them confides in you, an evangelist they both know. What do you do? The first step may be obvious. Tell the one who confided in you, stop that. The next steps are very difficult. Who do you tell? No one? Everyone? What do you advise others to do? 
If it is the man who confided in you, do you have him tell his wife? If it is the woman, do you have her tell her husband? Do you keep their secret as the one confiding in you usually begs you to do? Do you contact the leaders of one, both or any congregation? For all who have encountered such situations, whatever you choose will not please everyone. It will not. And so, many, many, many years ago, I didn't do so well with a situation like that. And I learned that the leaders of a congregation have to know the problems in their congregation. They must know for the good of all. Because no preacher should carry such burdens by himself. It is not appropriate. And also, if laws have been broken, our first call needs to be to the law. We should never think that we could carry burdens like that. So, if we get involved, expect to stand alone, but do not be afraid. And I'll close with this passage. Paul said about Alexander the coppersmith, he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged to them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. So we can trust the Lord will always stand by us and strengthen us when we're doing our best to serve him. And may the Lord bless us to help all we can in the time we have. And I'll stop now.